The Suwannee River, a living reminder of our heritage, meandering down from Georgia's Okefenokee Swamp through northwestern Florida to the Gulf of Mexico. Most of the river remains as peaceful today as when Indians fished its waters and lived on its shores. But for how long? Will the pressures of Florida's population explosion destroy the Suwannee? Or can the Suwannee be saved? The answer is explored in Seven Ways to Kill the Suwannee. Listen to the sounds of the Suwannee River, and you realize it is a living thing. Listen again, and you wonder if it will survive. Viewed from a satellite's eye in space, the Suwannee River emerges snake-like from the kidney-shaped Okefenokee Swamp, beginning its 240-mile journey from Georgia across Florida to the Gulf Coast. This kidney-like coincidence of form and function is not lost on those who have studied this swamp. For wetlands such as the Okefenokee serve as filtering systems, purifying the water and adding valuable nutrients vital to the existence of human and biological life. The history of human tinkering with the river began as early as the 1870s, when Atlanta lawyer Henry Jackson sought to take lumber, and possibly even phosphate, from the swamp. But how to use this land flooded with water? Jackson's solution was simple enough, drain the swamp. A canal was dredged with arrow-like precision into the heart of the swamp, but nature, it seemed, would hold to its own course. And rather than emptying the Okefenokee, the ditch merely poured more water into the swamp. The Suwannee Canal soon became known as Jackson's Folly. History seemed to repeat itself in the mid-1950s when pressure from lumbering companies, upset by a series of severe fires that naturally occur within the swamp, resulted in the construction of a dam and sill at the headwaters of the river. Their purpose? To keep the swamp flooded and protect the surrounding wetlands from burning. Exactly the opposite of Jackson's solution. But now, the kidney may be holding more water than it can handle. Uh, when you put a dam in there, you maintain water, even during dry periods. And uh, the, the swamp simply doesn't function like a swamp anymore. A swamp depends on flooding and drying and even burning for its survival. I remember uh, vividly having to draw a uh, conservation area two down and that I think there's some movements on now in conservation area three and so forth. What are those? Those are two large uh, diked areas of uh, natural Everglades that have been used for water uh, storage and supply, uh, managed by the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, the, the maintenance of a constant water level in those areas has changed them. They are no longer the sawgrass swamps that they used to be. They're becoming more like a lake. 
The most recent studies by the Institute of Ecology at the University of Georgia indicate the effects on the ecosystems of this area are long-term. Any conclusions are still preliminary, but the sill has reduced the frequency and severity of fires and may have changed the pattern of vegetational growth. Okafenoki personnel and local swampers have expressed concern about the rate marshes seem to be filling in. Because of the high water level at the sill, growth of new cypress appears to be completely inhibited. You only have to compare the vegetation on either side of the sill, cypress swamp on one side, pine forest on the other, to see man's intervention here. To some scientists, our lack of knowledge concerning the Swanee's complex system is extremely troubling. One of the things that we've learned about the Swanee is that uh, it's a very complex, it's a remarkably complex river. It's, people talk about the Swanee really being three rivers. It goes through three different physiographic provinces. When the river starts in the Okefenokee Swamp, the river that rises out of the Okefenokee Swamp is hardly at all like the river that you see dumping into the Gulf of Mexico. It goes through lots and lots of changes. You can see it in the water quality. When the river rises in the Okefenokee Swamp, it has a very low pH. It's very acidic water, tannic acid water. It has a pH of like 3.5 or 4, very low. By the time it gets down to the Gulf of Mexico, it's up to like pH of what, 8? Eight, eight, maybe 8.5. Now that's a four order of magnitude change in the, acid, in the pH of the water. You see the same kind of changes biologically. The river that you look at biologically in the upper provinces, in the upper reaches, is a much different river than what you see down at the very end. Um, it's cutting through limestone there. There's not a lot of substrate for biological communities to, to live on. Um, it's basically a what, what people describe as a depauperate fauna. There isn't a lot of critters living in the upper river. The river um, goes through remarkable changes in flow. The, the uh, Swanee has a really remarkable hydrograph. If you have a major rainfall event in the upper Swanee, uh, the river can go up as much as two feet. Only those creatures that can adapt to those, you know, really w wide changes in the, in the flow can live there. Um, there are times, there have been times where the Swanee was, uh, there's no flow in the Swanee, in the upper reaches of the Swanee. It's ponding, you know. There's times when big shoals are completely exposed, other times you can't find them. What I'm really driving at is it's hard to characterize the Swanee as a specific kind of river. If wetlands, like the Okefenokee, are vital organs to this living system, what can we expect from long-term clearing of forest, mining of phosphate, and possibly even peat in these environmentally sensitive areas? Moving downriver, we consider the case of Occidental Chemical Company's phosphate mining operation in Hamilton County. Occidental has mined over 4,000 acres in the Suwannee Valley and has the rights to mine more than 100,000 more. Anything you do has an effect on the environment. If you walk from here to your automobile, it has some effect on the environment. Surface mining with large drag lines, I think, uh, to some people, has an appearance of having a more drastic effect on the environment than, than you know, some other operations. We feel that it is a temporary use of the land. We have requirements. Uh, the state, of course, requires us to reclaim the land once we're to finish mining it, and we think in the long term that this is a temporary use of land, and, and the long-term land uses will be just as beneficial both environmentally and for human use as they would have been if we had never been here. Just how temporary is Occidental's use of the land? Dr. Ronnie Bess of the University of Florida's Center for Wetland Studies says, if someone were to ask me about mining in wetlands today, without the technology needed to return wetlands back to wetlands, I'd have to say definitely no. Occidental's Gene McNeil confirmed Dr. Best's concerns. As far as technology, I would agree with Dr. Best that, that it's not known that you can take a particular type of wetland, say a cypress bayhead, for example, and restore it to a cypress bayhead. You know, he's, he's right in that it would take uh, the same type of substrata such as the clay lens to restore a cypress bayhead. 
nature, given a few thousand years, would no doubt restore this area. Occidental's own reclamation sites reveal the promise of new life. But Helen Hood of the Suwannee River Coalition is concerned about the immediate effect of these operations on the river. Something that people don't realize until you see it from the air is that half of what's reclaimed will be open bodies of water. And there is, there's only about half that amount of land in the stretch where Oxy is mining, the, the surface water is the source of water for the river. And when you convert cypress swamps and um, pine flatwoods, which is filtering water very slowly into the river, into these open bodies of water with um, these land peninsulas and so forth, and with maybe pine trees growing on them, um, you have a much different situation with your, with your surface runoff into the river. I wouldn't say that Occidental Chemical Company has um, submitted themselves willingly to the jurisdiction of the department with regard to water quality. In fact, I believe they're t uh, challenging the constitutionality of our uh, dredge and fill regulations right now. They were involved in a substantial rule challenge with regard to our ability to regulate their dredging and filling of the headwaters of the Suwannee River. Uh, we're not totally in agreement with the Florida Department of Environmental Regulation uh, as to the extent of their jurisdiction, uh, which would be the, the area that they require us to obtain dredge and fill permits prior to mining. Uh, I don't think, in my opinion, the regulation is not clear on just how far their jurisdiction extends, and I think this is, this is something that's, you know, it's got to be resolved through the through the hearing and administrative process, and we feel we're in the process of resolving that issue. Uh, however, I mentioned earlier the the, Corps, the environmental impact statement we're doing for the Corps of Engineers. At the federal level, the, the laws and regulations are certainly clear as to the extent of the federal jurisdiction, and we will be required to obtain a Corps of Engineer permit on all of the wetland areas, which uh, you know, I believe will certainly cover all of where DER thinks they have jurisdiction. So we believe that when we complete this two to three year environmental impact statement, we will have addressed the state concerns as well as the federal concerns. And at that time, it, it may, may not make a lot of difference as to the extent of state jurisdiction. The cutting of lumber and wetlands is another perceived threat to the Suwannee. A recent state law exempts Florida's silviculture or forestry industry from many protective environmental regulations. We're cutting wood along the uh, Swanee area down there, but our company has a policy of leaving strips along the river and streams at least uh, 30 feet or 30 yards along the river so there's no uh, debris in the river or any cutting along it. Uh, we're cutting all species of hardwood in most areas down there. We're replanting with bedding and replanting with uh, pine trees. And the other areas are natural reforestation and hardwood. And we have uh, some areas that are, that are good drained areas. We plant in pines because it, the water doesn't flood over them too much when we have high water. But the other areas, uh, the hardwood is naturally regenerated. In other words, we just leave it and it comes back in a, a new stand of hardwood. But will the hardwoods regenerate themselves? And what will the effect on the river be if they do not? The uh, only threat that I see at this point in time would be that of uh, converting bottomland hardwoods into pine tree plantations. Now, once the bottomland hardwoods are removed, uh, especially if they're bulldozed out and all of the rootstock removed, you won't get the bottomland hardwoods back. Uh, once the pine plantations are in, then you have runoff from uh, rains and you lose the natural buffering zone that the bottomland hardwoods offer. Uh, it's sort of a natural filtering system. They were meant to be there and they serve an important function. The 
only real significant whitewater in the state of Florida is Big Shoals. Uh, during much of the year, Big Shoals is a class three rapid. During about four months out of the year, whenever the water level runs between nine and 13 feet. It's a canoeing area. It offers, is, offers an advantage of being able to approach springs that are on the side of the river and some very important springs. I think there's 21 springs of what they call the first magnitude, a very large type of spring. From Fargo, Georgia to White Springs, Florida, where we're at, is a distance of 52 miles. And in that distance, uh, you will see two houses, two boat ramps, two bridges, and uh, an abandoned hunting lodge. And that's all. Uh, in other words, seven human structures in a distance of 52 miles. So it's the seclusion of the upper portion of it, the winding, narrow channel in much of it. Uh, it has been a river that has been used. Uh, it started uh, uh, in the uh, early part of this century. There were quite a number of roads coming from here, from Georgia into this area where persons used to come to White Springs and other small communities on the river and use it for recreational purposes. The town of White Springs represents, in many ways, the tradition and romance of the Old South. It is here that tourists once flocked to bathe in the mineral-rich waters of the popular spring house. And it is here that artists and musicians gather each year to celebrate the traditions of Florida folk art and music. beginning a series of oil paintings of Suwannee River, something I've thought of doing for a good many years. And but now that I have plenty of free time, I am beginning to do that. Uh, but the river has been here a long time, and uh, there's been a lot of living along by it. And I was impressed. Uh, by the unique indication that it might have been put here on purpose for poor lost souls like me to retreat to, you know, and get themselves back together. For some reason, it, it hasn't changed like everything else. Um, it is very much like it was a hundred years ago and a hundred years before that. Uh, even the little towns, for some reason, uh, reached a certain comfortable size and then quit going as if, as if uh, stayed by some powerful but unseen hand, you know. <laughs> and I, the whole thing just impressed me that way. Um, None of them became big cities to pollute the river. And it's just a comfortable place. Swanee. Even the origin of the river's name suggests mystery and romance. Some believe that the river received its name from an ancient Indian princess. Most likely, it is a corruption of the words San Juan de Huacara the name of a 17th century Spanish mission. But regardless of the origins of the name, Swanee conjured up the air of romance that Stephen Foster was trying to capture for a ballad that would immortalize the Old South for millions of persons who would never see the river. And strangely enough, neither did Foster. While Foster was interested mostly in taking the romance of the river's name, those who actually came to dwell along its banks 
had more practical demands. As early as 10,000 BC, a succession of aboriginal cultures lived along the length of the river, dependent upon the abundant wildlife then thriving along its shores. Here they hunted camel and mastodon, and ambushed wild horses that roamed free in the Suwannee Valley. A later culture, the Tamaqua, called the Suwannee Winding River and fished its waters and hunted its banks for deer, turtles, and alligators. In the rich soil of the river valley, they planted maize, squash, and tobacco. Early Spanish explorers searched for wealth and brought warfare and disease, both of which resulted in severe loss of life for the Indians. The fertile Tamaqua lands were resettled by the Seminole, a conglomerate of tribes who moved south from Georgia and Alabama. By 1812, the Seminoles found themselves in competition with the ever-growing numbers of incoming settlers. A long, sporadic war ended with most of the Indians being shipped off to reservations in Oklahoma. And when the age of the frontier battle had passed and the century had turned, the river remained a treasure house of natural resources. And the lore of the Suwannee continues today. We still come to the Suwannee to celebrate its beauty, but the irony of this story, as one area resident put it, is that we may be loving the river to death. Many of the Suwannee's clear blue springs must be protected by walls of cement and chain link fences. For a group of young Floridians, exploring what's left of the river's wilderness is more than a trip into Florida's past. Okay. It is a journey into the self. Really, this program we're in, like it pushes yourself to do more than you can think you can handle. We ate rattlesnake on about our fourth day. We we um we was back at the at the place and a UPS truck ran over a four foot eight inch rattler and we skinned him and ate him that night. It was pretty good, you know. Some people might not think it's good, but it's good, you know. It's the first time I ever ate it, you know. It's, Pretty good. You know, you just think of all, everybody that's been down this river, you know that whenever it was like really not so spoiled, you know, it's pretty spoiled now. And back then, you know, it was just like, like it's just new and exciting, you know, I don't know. It's just, man just kind of messes up things every now and again, you know. If the wetlands that border the Swanee serve as a sort of kidney, filtering its waters and adding vital nutrients, then we might consider the river, with its tributaries, as the major arteries of this complex water system. Historically, however, human beings have come to view such a system as a cheap and efficient means to eliminate their waste, both biological and industrial. Large amounts of fertilizers and pesticides are used in the Suwannee watershed. Without the filtering systems of the wetlands, stormwater runoff carries these chemicals directly into the river. Thousands of septic tank drain fields are built perilously close to the river in areas prone to frequent flooding. For years, as the saying goes, the solution to pollution was dilution. But few people were willing to grapple with the question of cumulative effect. How much of a certain chemical was too much? And what unforeseen toxic nightmare might be forming downriver in the biologically sensitive estuary? The Swanee is presently classified as an outstanding Florida water, ensuring no significant degradation of the river. The problem, however, is that no one has yet to determine how much degradation is significant. We've been involved for about the last year and a half in uh, first in the designation of the Suwannee River as an outstanding Florida water, and since then in developing a, uh, a standard for the Suwannee, uh, a stringent standard to meet the requirements of 
of, uh, of Florida law pertaining to outstanding Florida waters. There's a provision in the law that says that there can be no significant degradation of an outstanding Florida water. And we've been wrestling with that term now for like the last eight months and uh, not making a lot of progress, to be frank. It's a very complex issue trying to come up with a, an equitable way to define that term that would allow for some discharge, but, but not enough that would cause any basic change in the, in the uh, biology of the river. One company that is attempting to come to grips with this problem is Occidental Chemical Company. For along the banks of the sleepy Suwannee River lies millions of dollars worth of one of the world's most valuable resources, phosphate. This phosphate is converted by Occidental into fertilizers and animal food products. Any industrial operation as complex as Occidental's involves the production of tons of chemical waste, which must be treated and disposed of. I'd like to make it clear, we're as in favor of the outstanding Florida water concept as anyone. As far as uh, the requirements under OFW for obtaining water discharge permits, uh, what we have maintained all along is that these requirements need to be made clear. You know, where it simply states no significant degradation, uh, we, we just feel that significant degradation needs to be defined. And probably a, an, an acceptable definition would be a discharge that has no uh, biological effect on the river. In spite of Occidental's investment in some of the best available technology, Many are still concerned its discharges, such as those into Swift Creek, may be significantly altering the quality of the Swanee. Then when you get to the area of their uh, water quality discharges from their mining operations or from their chemical plants, that's another water quality issue, as you mentioned before. Sometimes when we have people go by, they seem to be very much in compliance. At other times, they seem to have uh, what the industry terms upsets and what you could term less politely violations. I don't think there's any question that Swift Creek and Hunter Creek have been significantly altered. Environmental researcher Frank Sedmera has made extensive studies of Swift Creek and is concerned about possible adverse effects on the biological life of the river system. Not all biologists agree as to the consequences of, of this chemistry on, the, on Swift Creek. But if you compare the kinds of organisms, especially bottom dwellers who can't move like fish, if you compare the kinds of organisms in Swift Creek with what is present in other creeks like Rocky Creek, you'll find that most of the creeks in this area have a large percentage of organisms which need good quality water. And they can't make it in poor quality water. You will find very few of those types of organisms in Swift Creek. If you look at the water quality data for the Suwannee and you look at uh, up and downstream of Swift Creek, okay, it's clear that the discharge from Occidental from their chem plant has caused a, what's the proper term, a significant change in the water quality of the Suwannee River. That's very clear from the data for a number of parameters, ammonia, fluoride, uh, phosphorus, nitrogen. It's clear from the data that water quality is dramatically impacted by what comes out of Swift Creek. What isn't clear, though, is that that's caused any damage, per se, okay? I can show you a number of slides which can indicate to you that Swift Creek can be made to look like almost any type of water you would care to, to imagine it. I, in fact, I have slides that show that it is a number of different colors, green, red, brown, tan, and sometimes clear. So Swift Creek can be manipulated. There's, there's no, doubt, no doubt about that. be good to show the contrast of what the water looks like when it meets the Swanee. Yeah. Like right there. Is dilution the answer to pollution? And what might be the long-term effects of discharging phosphorus and fluoride into the river? As far as uh, future and long-term effects, uh, first of all, I'd like to say we're dealing with uh, pretty basic materials here. So the materials we're talking about here are phosphate. Our, our zone that we're mining contains fluoride, which is, you know, it can be considered uh, 
a contaminant. In certain concentrations, it would be a, a water pollutant. Uh, but the concentrations we're talking about here, say in our mining discharge, we're talking two to three parts per million. Many waters in the United States contain that much or more naturally. For example, the, the quantity of fluoride being contributed to the Suwannee River by the Withlacoochee River, which I believe is strictly from natural sources, is greater than the total quantity of fluoride that Occidental is discharging through it, all of its discharges combined. But environmentalists argue that unlike natural discharges from its tributaries, Occidental's discharges are unnatural to the river, and thus their long-term effect is unknown. There is evidence that they've elevated the levels of certain chemicals in the river. Um, and our concern is that th that will continue, and the cumulative effect of elevating those levels could be a very adverse impact on the estuary. Particularly, we're worried about phosphate, a lot of which is, dis is um, discharged and fluoride. And there are fairly large amounts of fluoride being discharged. And fluoride is a chemical like DDT that accumulates in the f food chain. Because Occidental is a subsidiary of Hooker Chemical, whose involvements in such incidents as New York's Love Canal have resulted in a number of court suits, Florida environmentalists are particularly cautious about the company's operations. The Love Canal is, is one of the, their involvements. They're in, uh, being sued by the state of New York for many millions of dollars. California is suing them for many millions of dollars. And Michigan, they've, they've had some major violations in Michigan. Mm -hmm. So th with a history like that, people are, are naturally very suspicious of them. Such close scrutiny has resulted in more frequent disclosures of upsets and violations of environmental regulations. A recent investigation of air emission violations resulted in the largest fine ever levied by the state of Florida against a private company. The investigation also turned up Occidental memoranda that revealed hazardous waste had been dumped at more than 20 sites through 1977. Among the chemicals mentioned, were spills of sulfuric acid contained on site and the dumping of capacitors containing PCBs. I, I think that report indicated that uh, there was a possibility that capacitors were placed in some of these sites. I don't think anyone here knows that, but there is a possibility that there are some there. Now, these PCBs in, would be contained in capacitors. As far as uh, PCBs, if they do exist in capacitors in that landfill, I think, uh, I don't think I know that this would have to be made known in the deed. And uh, yeah, we, we would have to indicate in the deed that there is a possibility that there are some capacitors containing PCBs were buried in this location and, and uh, due care would have to be taken. Such dumpings are now illegal and Occidental reports that has discontinued the practice. State agencies have not yet investigated these sites, and preliminary indications suggest their exact locations may be difficult, if not impossible, to determine. We had a, a wilderness area, a beautiful wilderness area in Dixie County, 188 acres, and uh, we were preserving it for uh, nature trails, and there was a beautiful little stream in there fed by hundreds of bubbling springs. And we got a notice last year that uh, the lease was canceled. And we found out that it had been sold without our knowledge. We could have done something about it if we had known ahead of time. They were supposed to give us 60 days notice. Well, they gave us 60 days notice of cancellation after the property had been sold. And uh, just to give you an idea of what it's like, there's some of the surveyors working in there were wading waist deep in water laying out the lots. No issue involving the Swanee seems to cut closer to the bone than the question of private property rights versus the public's right to preserve the river. For thousands of persons who fled the cold and congestion of the North, only to find congestion in overpopulated Florida cities, 
the lure of a weekend home on the Swanee is a powerful one. More than 10,000 lots have already been platted along the river, many of these in flood-prone areas. The desire for a waterfront, Florida, uh, waterfront property in Florida uh, has, is increasing, and there's less and less of it available. The Swanee River seems to be the, uh, the prime example now where, where the amenities, uh, waterfront property is available and uh, developers are taking advantage of it. The whole area along Swanee, Columbia, parts of Madison County are extremely flood prone. Uh, some of those lots will be uh, 15 to 18 feet under water uh, if we have a reoccurrence of the 48 or 73 flood. The unfortunate thing that's happening now is that the land sales that are going on uh, around the state and out of state, and the people who are coming in buying and developing uh, are not used to the kind of severe floods that, uh, that occur regularly on the Swanee River. Those are the individuals who will be crying to some organization of government, be it us at the regional level, the state or the federal government, to come bail them out the case of Riverside Acres and Lafayette County provides a clear example of the failure of government to control development along the river. When Miami's Context Development Corporation approached Lafayette County commissioners with an offer to donate a 20-acre parcel and spring for a county park in exchange for a variance to build roads and clear land bordering the Suwannee, representatives of this relatively tax-poor county found it difficult to resist. Some concerned residents were quick to point out the land in question was valuable wetlands. On the day of our visit to Riverside Acres, during a period of severe drought, we found many of the lots had small ponds of standing water. This is Cypress Knee Land. It's the, an area which right now with the water level as low as it is, there's still a great, it supports a great deal of life here. It is like a cushion to walk through this swamp. It's like a sponge. The rich humus that's here, when the water level comes up, this is standing water everywhere. And uh, all kinds of, of young life grows here. Now when this is developed into residential areas, there is nowhere for the waste matter of all descriptions that people bring to go except into the estuary and into the, into the Suwannee River system that all of us depend on. So actually, this is area where people just don't belong at all. We have a subdivision, uh, pretty lengthy regulations, and uh, they were to go by them, except in, they asked for a variance on the roads, on paving the roads, and we gave them, granted the variance, because they uh, offered to uh, deed the county a spring back here and 20 acres of land in lieu of the paving, you know. So uh, uh, we did that. Well, they owned this property, and I knew that they wanted to develop it, you know, but I wanted to take the county along with it, and I told them that they had some land, that part of their land was suitable, you know, for uh, subdividing for people to live on, and some wasn't. And I, that's what I've said all the time, you know, that they, they've got some good land, and then they've got some that they don't mean to be nobody on. Well, I don't know if I've seen any of the officials or not, but some of the crew that was building the roads and all back there, I told them that they had better uh, do some checking with the uh, Swanee River Management and all these others because they had brought this map to us and uh, that it looked very gloomy to us, very bad. And uh, they told me that they had, had cleared with everybody and that they thought they had everything all right. So at that time we had, uh, uh, and I don't know, now, if we have a right, you know, just to tell anybody that they can't develop their property, uh, I know that we've got regulations and all, and that we can tell them kind of how to do it, but I don't think that we can uh, just flat deny them. 